did you know? During Ocarina of Time's development, Shigeru Miyamoto and his team went to great lengths to make Link's animation as true to life as possible, and even built a motion capture studio at Nintendo HQ. The team made a mock horse to capture Link's animations riding Epona, and brought a real treasure chest on set to emulate Link getting items. They even had to rebuild and expand the mocap studio several times during production. Nintendo never named the actor who played Link, and also wouldn't identify the actor that inspired Link's design. In an interview with three Zelda artists, they said artwork for every Zelda game before Ocarina was handled by an outside studio, which resulted in Link looking a bit silly. But starting with Ocarina, Nintendo handled the series artwork in-house, which included what Link should look like. Instead of silly, they wanted him to look cool, a handsome character that could appeal to gamers in the West. According to Link's designer, Yusuke Nakano, he drew inspiration from a rather world-famous Hollywood actor. At the time, if you were to talk about a really good-looking actor, people immediately thought of this guy. So I recall keeping in mind the point of his nose and that strong will look in his eyes when I was drawing. The other artists in the interview confirmed the actor's name came up repeatedly during production, and all agreed he was quite the heartthrob. Link's age and appearance bear a strong resemblance to Leonardo DiCaprio in the 90s, and the timing matches up as well. Both 1996's Romeo and Juliet and 1997's Titanic released during Ocarina of Time's development. Titanic in particular was incredibly popular in Japan, and even made its worldwide debut in Tokyo, nearly two months before it was shown in the United States. None of the Zelda devs specifically named Link's inspiration, but their hints and the timing heavily suggests DiCaprio. Speaking of Link's appearance, Link's ears aren't pierced when he's a kid, but inexplicably, they are pierced when he's an adult. The story behind his piercing is actually explained in the Ocarina of Time manga, and although most fans don't consider it canon, the manga does include extra backstory and addresses some questions not answered in the game. In the manga, Impa trains adult Link in swordplay at Kakariko Village, then pierces his ears as a badge of honor. The Sheikah tribe performed this piercing to signify a boy growing into a man. In both the game and the manga, Link's mother was gravely injured in the Hyrulean Civil War, leaving Link in the care of the Great Deku Tree before his mother died. In the game, Link's father is never mentioned, but in the manga, Raro gives more backstory, explaining that Link's dad was a member of the Guardian House that served Hyrule's king, and was killed in battle just before Link Link's mother fled to Kokiri Forest. Ocarina also never mentions Zelda's mother, but in the manga it's made clear that she died before the events of the game. Likewise, early in Ocarina, Zelda talks about her father, but we're never told what becomes of him. Rather than leaving it to our imaginations, in the manga, Ganondorf tells Zelda that he killed her father as part of his coup, and that's what causes Zelda and Impa to flee the castle on horseback. But some changes in the manga go beyond just adding backstory, with some changes showing an alternate series of events. Instead of buying the Deku Shield at the shop, Link actually carves it from a piece of the Great Deku Tree's dead body. In the manga, Link can ride Epona not just as an adult, but also when he's a child. Interestingly, Child Link could also ride Epona in the game's beta, but the feature ended up getting cut from the final game. But the biggest difference between the game and the manga involves the Fire Temple boss Volvagia. Just after leaving the Kokiri Forest, Child Link buys a baby dragon in Castle Town for 70 rupees, and the two quickly become best friends. But when Link arrives at the Fire Temple seven years later, his pet has grown into a massive dragon and fallen under the influence of Ganondorf's curse. Link begs Volvagia to remember their friendship, but it's no use, and Link has no choice but to slay the dragon by cutting off its head. With its last breath, Volvagia's decapitated head lets out a whimper, crying Link's name. Link then swears vengeance on Ganondorf, vowing he'll never forgive what he did to Volvagia. The manga also gives more insight to Zelda's relationship with Shake. On page 295, the princess says she's literally transforming into a boy, and Impa puts Zelda to sleep, sealing her inside the sacred realm while her body is reawakened as Shake. The events depicted in the manga, as well as in-game clues like her eye color changing from blue to red, led some fans to believe Zelda and Shake are actually two different people, and Shake is literally male. Some even believe this makes the character transgender. Nintendo rarely makes official rulings on fan theories, but in 2014, Bill tried of Nintendo Treehouse did just that, telling Polygon, The definitive answer is that Shake is a woman, simply Zelda in a different outfit, thus settling the argument once and for all. After Ocarina of Time's development was complete, Miyamoto took an unusual amount of interest in the game's localization, making sure his story was told properly all around the world, but he wasn't always so involved. Localizations for earlier games in the series were pretty hit and miss, especially the original Zelda on NES, and the French versions were particularly goofy. Where the master 
Master Sword was localized as Excalibur. Despite the shoddy work, Nintendo's French translator didn't actually get fired until an awkward encounter at Nintendo HQ, when Zelda director Takashi Tezuka invited the localizers into a meeting one day for small talk, asking what they'd been up to the night before. The French translator said she'd been souvenir hunting at a sex shop, and pulled some obscene toys and magazines out of her purse, showing them to Tezuka and telling jokes we can't repeat here on YouTube. According to German translator Claude Moyes, who was in that meeting, I've never before seen such faces, and never have since then. Mr. Tezuka's face got a green tint and he took a few steps back as if she was possessed. She was fired one week later, without any special explanations given. I really think it was because of Mr. Tezuka. Mr. Miyamoto would have had more humor, for sure. Now in need of a new French translator, they looked to their gamer tip hotline. Back in the early days of the internet, if fans got stuck in a game, they'd call Nintendo directly and talk with a tipster who could give them advice. One of those tipsters was Julian Bartikoff, who said that Miyamoto took the localization process for Ocarina of Time very seriously, and personally quizzed Julian with over 50 lines of text in Japanese, English, and French. Julian passed Miyamoto's test, and being the super fan he was, took the initiative of adding lots of unique flair to the French version. One example is giving the Deku Tree Sprout a lisp due to the twig in his mouth. Did you know gaming spoke with Julian, who said he also saved the game from a huge embarrassment. I realized that Deku could be pronounced in French as Deku, which means of ass. That'd be horrible in some part of the game since Deku nuts would be nuts of the ass and Deku seeds would be seeds of the ass. So I changed the name Deku to Mojo, which sounds very cool and mystical. The Nintendo executives loved it and all the other unique changes, so they rewarded me. They said, one gossip stone in the Kakiri forest is yours. You can make it say whatever you want. Every gossip stone in every language is basically the same, except for one stone in the French version, which says, it's rumored that Zelda's translator is super cool and super hot. Speaking of Dekus, Miyamoto says his favorite enemy in Ocarina of Time is the Deku Scrub, because sometimes they attack you, sometimes they offer you valuable information, and sometimes they're more interested in commerce. What makes them interesting is that at a distance, you can't tell if they're friend or foe. In an interview just after Ocarina's launch, Miyamoto said he wanted to add more of these sorts of characters, but unfortunately, Deku Scrubs were the only ones that made the game's final cut. As most Zelda fans are well aware, after Ocarina of Time released in 1998, an expansion called Ura Zelda was planned for the Nintendo 64 DD. But most fans are unaware that after the 64 DD's eventual failure, Miyamoto considered releasing Ura Zelda on the N64 as a regular cartridge title about one year after the launch of Ocarina. Miyamoto said, There were several ideas I could not incorporate into Zelda because of the lack of time and various other factors. For example, I wanted to create some extra dungeons and challenges for those who had a completed quest, and we planned for them with the predicted introduction of the DD, but now we don't know whether we'll do this or not. We may have to introduce a special edition cartridge next year instead. In a later interview, he added that Ura was planned to include some parody games to replace those found in Ocarina's version of Hyrule, but ultimately a special edition N64 cartridge was never released. Instead, a more modest form of Ura called Master Quest became a bonus disc for pre-ordering Wind Waker on GameCube. The promotion was a huge success, making Wind Waker the most pre-ordered game of all time, with over half a million copies. But many fans were disappointed when they realized Master Quest only featured the remixed dungeons, and was lacking any parody games or extra challenges. Miyamoto told fans Master Quest is a Rosalda, but the Hyrule remix was so minor that many fans to this day still don't consider it Rosalda. instead classify Aura as one of the series' lost games. Did you also know, Retro Studios spent three years working on a Zelda spin-off game on the Wii, or that Twilight Princess almost got a Majora's Mask style sequel? If you want to hear about 9 lost Zelda games, click the video on screen. I'm Seth Everman.